Hi, thanks for watching the sermon on YouTube. We'd like to invite you to come to church, though. We meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. at Cross Point Community Church. And may God bless you. Turn with me, if you will, to Galatians, the third chapter. We are um, in a, a series in the book of Galatians, and we are so glad that you're here for it. As you all know, Galatians was one of the first, if not the first, New Testament book written. It's, a, uh, it's just a great book, and it deals with, uh, that we, tells us how we're supposed to live the Christian life, not only by grace through faith, and, but how we begin the Christian life by grace through faith as well. So uh, join me in reading through those first 14 verses, and then we'll go to the Lord uh, and ask Him to bless our study of the Word. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit? by the works of the law, or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provide you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, do it by the works of the law, or by hearing with faith? Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. For as many as are the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law. To perform them, do them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them, or the law does them, shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we, the church, would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the Apostle Paul. We thank you that he gave us this blessed word that is able to make us wise unto salvation, which gives us everything that we possibly need to know that we might be equipped, adequate for every good work. We thank you so much that we can study it freely here in this country, and we would pray and ask and not assume or presume that that freedom will be here long term. We thank you for that now. We thank you that we can gather as your body here to love on each other, to learn from each other, and to be with each other. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a senior citizen was driving down the highway, his car phone rang. Answering it, he heard his wife's frantic voice warning him, Herman, I just heard there's a news flash. There is a car going the wrong way on the highway. Please be careful. Darn, said Herman, it's not just one car, it's hundreds of them going the wrong way. (laughs) 
You see, there's a danger in going the wrong way on a one-way street. Billy Graham just passed and was buried, you know, and on his tombstone was this verse from John 14. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You see, what he explicitly says is that there is a one-way street if you want to spend eternity with God in heaven. And that is the street called grace built by the Lord Jesus Christ. As our song said today, upon his shoulders he bore your sin. There are some things that are black and white. There are some things that are just plain stupid. Going the wrong way on a one-way street does not increase your chances for longevity. But we find in Paul's day that there were already people that were driving the wrong way on Grace Boulevard. They're called the Judaizers. Unfortunately, we still have those that are driving the wrong way on the street of grace. You see, the Judaizers were saying this. In order to be saved, it's not enough just to believe the message of life. It's not enough just to believe the gospel. You've got to do something else. And for them, it was believe on Jesus and then be circumcised or keep the Mosaic law. There was others of those that are called Judaizers that would say, well, in order to live the Christian life, you've got to keep the Mosaic law. And we're going to talk about that in this passage. Unfortunately, there are people today who still believe that you must keep the law in order to demonstrate or justify your salvation. I'm here to tell you the Bible doesn't teach that. I'm here to tell you that justification by grace through faith will cost you nothing, but cost the Trinity everything. And that truly is the good news. When Paul found out that these Galatians were trying to go the wrong way on a one-way street, he wrote this book called Galatians. We're now in the third section of Galatians where Paul is defending the superiority of the gospel. He's confirmed the truth of the gospel in those first messages that we delivered. And now he's going to defend that salvation by grace through faith is far superior than salvation by works through law. You see, he had a group of people that he that were going the wrong way toward righteousness. Charles Swindoll made this statement. He said, Our salvation from beginning to end is the work of the Sovereign Father through the mediating person of the work of Jesus Christ by the finishing work of the Holy Spirit. It is all by grace. From Beginning to end, it's by the grace of God that we are saved. So Paul, finding out that the Galatians are equivocating on salvation by grace through faith, writes this epistle. He's starting to pull the gloves off in the third chapter. And he's going to ask five questions to try to get these Galatians, if you will, to sober up. Because they were going the wrong way like a drunk on a highway. So he starts off by asking what I'm going to call the minister's question. And this is like he can hardly believe what is going on here. And as he asks the minister's question in this first section, and then he's going to go to Abraham in the second section. And finally, he's going to go to the law in the third section. He's going to jar them out. He's going to bring them to a hopeful point of sobriety. Galatians is a cup of black coffee 
to those that are going the wrong way because they're under the influence of something else. He's going to ask those five questions to point out the foolishness of what the Galatians are doing. You might, and you know, my son being a fireman has been on scenes where there's been a car wreck. Uh, the person has been under the influence, and although he can't do that, he wants to go up to that person and says, are you stupid? I have no idea where he picked up that phrase, but Paul picks up that phrase in Galatians 1.1. And in Galatians 1.1, he asks what I'm calling the minister's question. He says, you stupid saints. Now, the reason I call that the minister's question is because on a regular basis, those of us that are pastors hear something that a parishioner is doing. I will tell you that our first response is not always, will bless their little soul. Many times our first response is, are they stupid? What are they doing? Now, you must understand that this carry even more import for a Jew to call someone foolish. For if you read throughout the book of Proverbs, the thing that is disdained is foolishness. The man that is disdained is the fool. You don't want to be a fool when it comes to spiritual things, especially when it comes to salvation. So therefore, Paul makes this statement, you foolish Galatians, you're acting stupid. And for them, they would have known this is a slap on the face. He's trying to sober them up. The reason I say he's tr trying to sober them up, because he says, who's bewitched you? Who's led you astray? Who's put a spell on you? They are under the influence. Now, I know that it's never happened to any of you all, but perhaps you know a friend of a friend of a friend that maybe has been um, a little too celebratory. And they are under the influence of something else. They don't act right, do they? And you see what Paul is saying, the only way that I can come to the conclusion the only way, by the way, I saw that look, Dan. The only way I can come to that conclusion is that you have been bewitched by somebody else. And that's why he says, who has bewitched you? And he says, the amazing thing is, I pointed out the grace of God in the cross of Christ, and now you're doing something that is just utterly stupid. I spent weeks preaching the message of life, the grace of life, the cross of Christ, and now you think that you can do something to add to what Jesus Christ did on the cross. You see, he tells them to sober up. Sober up. The second question that he asks is what I call the, um, the means question. And that's found in verse 2 where he makes this statement. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or hearing with faith? Now that's an interesting phrase when he said hearing with faith. You see, they had all received the Holy Spirit. Now, that's something that's unusual in biblical history. In fact, if you were to look in the Old Testament, not every Jew got the Holy Spirit, even those that were very serious about practicing Judaism. You see, the only ones in the Old Testament that received the Holy Spirit were either prophets, priests, or kings. Prophets priest, or kings. And the reason they received the Spirit, the reason they got the Holy Spirit, was in order that they might, if you will, carry out the mission that God's called them to. That's why David prays a prayer that you and I could never pray today. He prayed, Lord, take not your Holy Spirit from me. 
Now, I'm sorry, you're stuck with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you in the Holy Spirit. It was promised in John, the 14th chapter, that when he leaves, he would send the Spirit. And from that moment on, except for a brief transitional period, everyone that believed received the Spirit the moment they believed. Now, Paul's argument is this. I just want to find out one thing. How many of you all had the Holy Spirit when you were keeping the law? No one. You see, the law cannot impart the Spirit of God to you. The law cannot bring life. How many of you all received the Holy Spirit before the law? Nobody did. The implication is, you all got the Holy Spirit after the law. You see, Romans the 8th chapter, verse 9, says that if you have not the Spirit, you're not a child of God. There are some today that teach, there's a teaching, that you can be saved and yet not get the Spirit. It has to come secondarily sometime later in what's called a second blessing. Well, Ephesians 1.3 blows that out of the water. Because Paul says in there, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You see, the moment you believe, God backs up the truck and unloads every one of His blessings on your life. The first being the Holy Spirit. Because that's how you're regenerated, Titus 3, 5. But how do you get that? Turn with me, if you will, to John, the fifth chapter. Notice what he says in John the fifth chapter. John 5 reads this. Jesus is speaking. And Jesus says, truly, truly. Whenever he says, truly, truly, that means, listen, listen. It's very important what I'm saying. Truly, truly, I say to you, now watch the progression here. He who hears my word, That's the first thing. Just put a little one next to that and circle it. First step. He who hears my word. Remember, an unmarked Bible is an unused Bible. Mark in it. He who hears my word. Secondly, and does what? Believes him who sent me. What's the progression? Hear and what? Believe. All right? Look at this third step. Has what? Hear, believe, have eternal life. When do you get eternal life? The moment you do what? Believe. There are some people today that teach, um, and I read that gentleman last week. Some of you all know who I was uh, referring to. I quoted him last week. Some people teach this doctrine that's called. Um, Initial and final justification. Initial justification happens the moment you believe. But you have not gotten to final justification. Final justification only comes if you stay faithful, if you do all the right things, and you do that till the moment you expire and die. If you believe and get initial justification, but then you do not continue to to believe and to work for Christ, you'll never get final justification, and you'll die in your sins. So it's possible, some teach, which I don't, that you can get initial justification, and my problem with that is you never know if you're going to get what? Final justification. So if you don't know if you're going to get final justification, you don't know if you are what? Saved. What does the Scripture say right here? Hear, believe, have. Can I ask a question? Is this Scripture true? 
Is the doctrine of final justification true? No, it's not. Why? It disagrees with God's word. Now, notice what else it says. And I love this. It's one of my favorite passages. Has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. What does it say? Hear, believe, has, and has not, does, and does not what? Come into judgment. Final justification sounds like judgment to me. But it just says you don't come into judgment. You see what he's trying to say to them is that when you receive the Spirit, when you were saved, and that's kind of a synonym, if you will, for receiving the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit comes the moment you're saved, except, as I mentioned, that brief transitory time. He says, did you receive the Spirit by the works of law? Did, were you saved by the works of law? No, you've done those all your life, and you weren't saved. You only were saved by the hearing with faith. Just like John says, hear, believe. Hearing with faith. You see, someone as well said, I think Dr. Gr um, I'm trying to think of the last name. He made this statement. He says, beginning your salvation by the Spirit. And then trying to perfect it with the works of the law is like beginning to bake a cake in the oven and finishing it in the freezer. That's how stupid it is. So he's asked the minister's question. He's asked the means question. Next, he's going to ask the maturity question. And again, he says to them, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, you're now perfecting it in the flesh? Now, God began a work this way. It never works out well when you try to modify it to your way. The Spirit of God is the one who births you, Titus 3, 5. And it is the Spirit of God because Paul later in the fifth chapter of Galatians is going to say, walk by the Spirit. He's the one that enables you to live the Christian life. He asked a third question here. I mean, a fourth question. And that's what I call the maltreatment question. Did you suffer so many things in vain if indeed it was in vain? Now, I've given you the scripture, and because of time, I won't read the entire scripture. It's in your notes as well. But one of the things that you'll find as you go back and you read through these scriptures is you're going to find that the early church was persecuted unmercifully. In fact, in this very passage, Paul the Apostle was stoned and they thought he was dead. And he pulled a Monty Python. I'm not quite dead yet. I really am feeling much better. And what he's saying is this. That you went through all that stuff. And notice what he says. And if you go back into Judaism, you're going to lose all those blessings and rewards. If you look at 2 John, I know most of you spend a lot of time in those little Johns. They're great books, by the way. But if you look in 2 John or 3 John, but write it down, 2 John 2, 9. And what he's essentially saying is this, if you give up, he never says you'll lose your salvation, but you will lose a full reward. There are some that accuse those of us who teach faith alone, grace-based salvation, that it's easy believism. But we also teach that God expects you to be serious about the Christian life. And I will tell you that today. That if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you take it ephemerally, if you take it lackadaisically, if you take it slightly, you're not serious every day about living the Christian life, 
I will guarantee you on the basis of God's reward, that I bet God's word that there's a loss of reward in heaven. Never lose heaven. But you will not be highly rewarded in heaven. I don't know about you. But if Jesus motivated me with rewards, shouldn't I get out there and try to get as many as I can? The answer is yes. It makes a difference how you live the Christian life. The fifth question is what I call the miracles question. He says to them in this verse, he says, So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law. Notice he keeps coming back to the works of the law, works of the law. Why? Because the Judaizers are saying, if you're really going to get this Christian life right, and I'll cut them some slack on that. I don't agree with it, but I can see how you'd come up with that. I mean, if only the only Bible you have is the Old Testament, which that was the case, and then you trust Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus, and you place your faith in Him, you've still got the only Bible you've got is the Old Testament. So it'd be easy for someone to say, hey, i got to go back and keep the works of the law if I'm really saved. And Paul is saying to them, no. That is an obsolete, not book, there's a lot we can learn there, but it's an obsolete covenant as Hebrews tells us. He's done away with it. And he right now wants you to hear with faith. And I can only imagine Paul's going, guys, I'm trying to write these books as fast as I can. But, but it takes a while to get these books out. I'm waiting for inspiration. It takes a while. And most of the books that Paul wrote were dealing with foolish saints, problems in the church. So Paul writes five things to these churches. And in these five things, he is telling them, trying to get them to move away from keeping the law, salvation, by grace through faith. In those first five verses, he tells the church to sober up. Verse 2, he says, fess up. Verse 3, he says, back up. Verse 4, he says, stay up. And in this one, he says, wise up. Wise up. God works miracles through Christ. Now, he says to these Galatians that are wanting to go back to the law and keep the Old Testament, he said, um, why do you go just go back to the law? Why would you just go back to Moses? Now, you've got to understand that most Jews, Moses was daddy rabbit. Because Moses gave them the law, something no other nation ever had. So Paul says, listen guys, let's back it up even farther. I can make my argument on how stupid you are, not just from Moses, but I'm going to go all the way back to Abraham. He is called Father Abraham. Now why was Abraham so important? Because you see the Jews put all kinds of stock in the fact that Abraham was their father. Turn with me to John, the 8th chapter. I want to show you a dialogue of why Abraham was so important and why Paul probably went here. And you're going to see that in Paul's argument. But I want you to get this as the backdrop. See, it's so important that you know all of Scripture. You know, we talk about always translating Scripture in its context. You know what the biggest context is? The Bible. That's why you need to study all the Bible. Yes, that even means Deuteronomy, which is subtitled, Abandon Hope, All Ye Who Enter In. John's not that way. John's different. I'm not talking about you, John. I'm talking about it. Although you are a little weird too, you know. Notice what he says in verse 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him. Now let's stop. He was saying to those Jews who had what? Hmm. 
if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Okay, let's stop. Stop just a minute. They believed him. That means they're what? What are they if they believed him? They're saved. They're saved, right? You got that one right. I love this church. You all are so smart. They are saved. But then he adds something else. He adds an if. He adds a contingency on it. Look at that. If you continue in my word, then you are disciples of mine. You see, it is possible to be a Christian and not a disciple. Disciples of follower, someone that takes Christ seriously. All you have to do to be a Christian is to believe the gospel. But if you want to be a disciple, you've got to ratchet it up. You've got to take it further. You've got to do more. And that's the, those are the ones he rewards. Now, I'm just, I want to warn you now. Because there will come a time, 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, where you shall stand before the bame of the judgment seat of Christ. And you must give an account for how you've lived your life, not for salvation. That's great white throne, Revelation 20. But he's going to ask you, all right, I saved you. I gave you the spirit. I gave you the word of God. What did you do with it? I... I want to reward you, and if you can show me what you did, I'll reward it. It's almost like going in for a year-end review, and the boss says, oh, tell me what you did. Tell me these goals. You did this, you did this. He says, you're getting a bonus. You're going to be highly rewarded rather than, by the way, I think it's uh, Steve Walkup that makes a statement that Jesus talks about, um, even a cup of cold water in my name, you'll get rewarded for. But he calls that a scratch-off reward. Anybody can do that. We're talking about highly rewarded. Read on. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. How do you know the truth? I and, mean, you know, we see it on our, our, our public buildings, don't we? We see that statement, you know the truth, truth makes you free. On, on courthouses a lot. But you will know the truth how if you do what? In the word. Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. John 17. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but for through me. John 14, 6. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants. <laughs> and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? We're of Abraham. We're Jews. Jesus answered them. Truly, truly, listen, listen. I say to you, everyone who comes, commits sin, is a slave of sin. All of us are enslaved to sin from the moment of birth because we do sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. How do you get freedom? Jesus. I know that you are of Abraham. Notice what he says. You are of Abraham's descendants. They've got Jewish blood in them. Yet you seek to kill me, which doesn't make sense to me, Jesus says, because my word has no place in you. If you continue in my word, you are what? My word has no place in you. I speak the things which I've seen with my father. Whoa. He's going off the rose. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. And I think he's trying to say, oh, we don't have the same daddy here. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. We're going to see what was the deed of Abraham? He believed. He believed God. But as it is, you're seeking to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which hasn't made you free yet. Which I heard from God, this Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. And they said to him, 
We are not born of fornication. We have one Father, God. Now that's important that you understand that because that's the argument that a Jew would fall back on is Abraham is our father. Therefore, we're in like Flint. Let's see what Paul says to that. He says, the faith of Abraham is not your faith. And you Judaizers that are going back to the law, he says, why don't you go all the way back to Abraham and find out where true righteousness comes from. The righteousness from his faith. The righteousness from his faith. And he says here, even so, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned, counted as to him as righteousness. What did Abraham do? He believed. He believed God. Has nothing to do with works. And you Judaizers that are trying to uh, do things to make God like, and we have Christians do that. You know, I'll give up this, and you know, we're in this Lenten season, and I'm not giving up ice cream for Lent. Number one, it's too good and God's not impressed. I mean, giving out, giving up the best ice cream in all the world, Rocky Mountain Road, Blue Bell ice cream, the best ice cream in all the road or world. It's not going to impress God. Nothing you can do will impress him. The only thing that gets his attention is if you believe him. And here's what he's saying. Even so, Abraham believed God and his reckoned as righteous. Now, let's stop and just examine that. It's in Genesis 15. I can't teach you through Genesis 15. But I want to teach you this portion from Genesis 15. When he believed God, that was 10 years before circumcision. 400 years before the law. So I'm not a math major. But I think I can say, based upon math, Abraham was not justified by works, either keeping the law or circumcision. Because it was, he believed God, John 15, 6, and it was reckoned that moment, that second, as righteousness. He was justified. He didn't have to do anything else. He was justified at that very moment moment. Secondly, what Paul does, he says, let's look at the relationship from his faith, the relationships that took place. You see, in here he says, therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. How do you get to be a son of Abraham? What does it say up there? You believe. If you believe, you're a son of Abraham. Now, let me dispel something. You don't become Jewish. Remember I talked last year about the Jewish wannabes? I mean, last week, there's a group. And they're, they're around here. They're, there's people that start studying the Bible. Oh, I want to be a Jew so bad. I think I'll keep the dietary thing. What? You're not going to have any BLTs, baby backs? You're not going to eat crab? You're not going to eat lobster? Are you stupid? I mean, you're going to do that, and you're going to think, God's going, Oh, wow, look at that Gentile. He's keeping the law, and God's going, is he stupid? Therefore, be sure that as those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Let me stop on that phrase, sons of Abraham. It has nothing to do with kind of like father, son. Sons of, in the Jewish parlay, in the Jewish idioms, meant a follower of. You see, if you believe and believe alone, you became a follower of Abraham who was believing. You don't become Jewish. I've given you a great quote by a friend of mine, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum. And there's no way that a Gentile ever becomes a Jew. You don't do that. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew. Now, I guess you could do a Sammy Davis and convert to Judaism. But you don't do that. You don't become kind of this Gentile Jew by believing in Jesus. 
Are you, are, are you so insecure that you've got to be a Jew to feel special? I feel special because I'm a child of God. I feel special because Christ died for me. I don't need any Jewish heritage. Secondly, he says that he is the redeemer in his faith. Notice what it says in verse 8, the scripture foreseeing. Now let's stop. The scripture foreseeing that God would, oh my goodness, if you're a Jew, you're going to get heartburn at this next phrase. Does what? Justifies the Gentiles? Oy vey, Gentiles, the dogs. I don't have nothing to do with them. Not a bad Jewish accent. He says the scripture. Now, what, let's stop. What scripture is he talking about? Old Testament. The scripture for seeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. What is the scripture? It preaches the what? Gospel. John's teaching a class. It'll be this Tuesday, right, John? John's teaching this Tuesday. It's called the gospel in the Old Testament. Did you know a lot of us think gospel's New Testament? It's not. Here it is. Even before the law, the gospel was there, which is by grace through faith. He preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, and watch what he says. All the nations will be blessed in you. Now, can I ask you a quick question? I was an English major. I know most of you weren't. But can I just ask you kind of an English major, you know, kind of question? That word A-L-L. How much, what percentage of all is all? All nations. All, that even includes you Jews. Because Israel is a nation. It includes America. It includes Spain. Every nation that's ever existed, God wants to bless them if they will do what? Believe the message of life. All nations will be blessed in you. And what happens as a result of that? There's recompense. So then those who are of faith, he concludes Abraham's section here, those who are of faith, are blessed with Abraham, not the worker, but the believer. Now, it's very important that you circle that word blessed. Blessed. It's going to play a big role in our final section. You'll see that in just a moment. Because he's going to talk about how the law was and is a failure. It's a failure for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's a failure to protect you. It's bad Kevlar. What does he say? For as many as are the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of law to perform them. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Now you see this word curse. If you read Genesis, the book of Genesis, you will fi first find these words curse and blessing in Genesis. You'll first find them there. It is a huge theme throughout the Bible. The idea of cursing and blessing. Cursing and blessing. Let me give you a brief definition of what both those mean. A curse <clears throat> is anything that hinders. For instance, um, it could be said of Mark, his golf swing is a curse to winning money. <laughs> but that could also be said of me as well. <laughs> I woke Mark up just then. He heard his name and heard golf with it. And he heard curse and he's saying, what? So. You see, a curse is anything that hinders you from doing something. Some of us that play golf have bad backs. Oh, the back is a curse to me. It hinders me. 
A blessing is anything that helps you, enhances you. For instance, all of us men in this room would say our greatest blessing is our Thank you very much, man. I just want to be sure you said that because you're in trouble if you don't. But let me show you where else that whole idea of blessing and cursing shows up. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 27. And this is where our quote up there comes from. I'll read it to you. Cursed is he who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say amen. What, you are under a curse if you don't do what? Keep the law. That's a curse. You're hindered. Okay? Now I want you to look, and chapter 28 is called the blessing and cursing chapter. Look at 28 verse 1. 28 verse 1. He says this. Now it shall be if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all of his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings will come upon you and will overtake you if you obey the word of the Lord. There was blessings that came out of them obeying the Mosaic law. In fact, God says, if you don't obey the Mosaic law, I'm going to scatter you abroad. Now look at Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. It changes. He says this, but it shall come about that if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes with which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Now, quick question. How many in here have lived an absolutely perfect life? You have never sinned. You've never broken a commandment. You never told a lie. You've never lusted after a new iPhone. You've done everything perfectly. I see some heads dropping when I said lusted after the new iPhone. I knew I could condemn all. You know what? Just because you did that, you're under the curse. Law was never given to Gentiles. But if we as Gentiles don't do the things that are right, we are under a curse. That's what it says there. And you Judaizers especially who were given the law and you don't do the things that they're, you're certainly under the curse. Now here's what people want to do today. And this is goofy. This is just goofy stuff. The law of Moses is in three sections. The moral law, don't, you know, don't, don't go shoot a man in Laredo just to watch him die. That's the moral law. The civil law has to do with all the government stuff. How, uh, you know, how Israel governed themselves. And the ceremonial law was all that, you know, kind of how you approach the sacrifice and do all that. There's three sections. There are 613 commands in there. How many of you all know all 613? How many know at least one? You know one, right? Okay, is it fair to say that since you don't know, maybe you know 612, but you don't know that 13th one, you're not even doing it so you're condemned, okay? That means you're cursed. But what people will try to do today is say, well, the, the civil law and the ceremonial law aren't in effect today. You know, uh, we, we as Gentiles, we just keep the moral law. Really? Who died and made you God? How can you parcel out what laws you're going to keep and what laws you're not going to God gave 613. They're all contained in there, so you're going to pick and choose. Stop eating pork. And those crab rolls, lobster rolls, and for sure crawdaddies, those of y'all that have been down mud puppies. Let me tell you something, gang. In the Bible, there are 66 books. I call it Highway 66. 65 are for sanctification. There's only one book in the Bible for justification. That's John. But there's a whole lot of condemnation in those 65 if you don't do it, unless you've gotten to the one book, the Gospel of John, for salvation. 
The problem is that there's a failure to purify. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident for the righteous man shall live by faith. Or I think a better translation as John and I talked about this is this. Those righteous by faith shall live. Now, what have we just talked about? A curse? But if you will believe in Christ, you can overcome, get out from under, absolve yourself from the curse. Those righteous by faith, not works, shall live. It's a quote from Habakkuk. 2-4. You see, the righteous by faith are the ones who get out from under the curse. Why? Because the law is not of faith, and he who practices them shall live by them. If you try to practice all 613, you'll die. Plus, you're no fun to hang out with. But you see, the way that you get out from that is what the law could not provide Jesus provided, 13 and 14. He says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law that kills us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You know anyone hung on a tree? In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come, and here where the Jews get heartburn again, the blessing of Abraham might come to whom? Gentiles. <clears throat> Abraham believed before their circumcision. He was justified. Abraham believed before there was law. He was justified. We as Gentiles don't have to keep the law to be justified. It is believing in Christ. Righteous. Those righteous believers will live. So that we, that is the church of Jesus Christ, would get the Holy Spirit. If you're going down the wrong way on a one-way street, Paul's saying you're foolish. You've never considered the faith of Abraham, which began way before the law and circumcision. And not only that, you've never realized that what you're putting yourself under is a failure. It will not accomplish what you need. So turn around back on the highway of grace and walk with Jesus Christ.